making it enough. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I think everybody's back. We still have 80 people, which is fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us uh, on a, uh, a, a summer Thursday night. So I really appreciate everybody's uh, long uh, attention, and I hope that there were uh, good conversations in, in uh, each of the breakout groups. Um, we just have one slide remaining in the last three minutes here. I want to make sure that folks um, uh, have a chance to see ways that we will continue to stay involved with you. So just one second here. I've got to find the right screen. All right. Uh, can somebody just let me know that they can see the thank you by shaking head yes? Great. Or thumbs up. Thank you. Um, so again, thanks to everybody. Um, to continue the conversation, would definitely encourage you, you can use the QR code here to download the IRIS app. Um, there will be uh, further posting here of uh, follow-up surveys, as well as um, opportunities for you to download pictures and ideas that you have um, that might occur to you uh, later tonight that you didn't get a chance to relay today. Uh, we'd love to collect them through the app. Um, of course, our team is always available to answer further questions by email or otherwise. Um, a couple of follow-up steps. We will be uh, developing a summary of the discussions from tonight. So we will uh, download everything, process it, and uh, provide kind of a summary of the overall discussion by each area. I know folks are probably really curious about what was discussed uh, in each of the areas. So uh, we'll give an opportunity to uh, summarize that for folks' benefit. Um, and then keep an eye out for additional uh, public meetings. We'll be talking to the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee uh, a couple more times, at least through the course of this project as we refine these ideas. And so those will be opportunities for, uh, for you all to continue to learn about um, and uh, hear what we're, what we're working on. And finally, the uh, uh, website address for the Coastal Resilience Plan is posted here and uh, would love to uh, just have you check that out and again, check out the mid-project report. So that brings us to a conclusion. Um, I will turn it over to uh, Vince Murphy, who's the town's uh, Coastal Resilience Coordinator uh, to uh, say a few final words. Uh, thank you very, very much, Trevor. I'm going to be extremely brief and quick, hopefully. So um, the CRP is one of the, the big resilience efforts going on at the moment, but it's not the only one. I also have to uh, say that um, Holly and her uh, efforts with Resilient Nantucket Designs for Adaptation, which are coming to a conclusion this month, have uh, proven invaluable. They have been a, a leading point uh, for the CRP and have uh, provided critical input along the way. And I just particularly like working with Holly. I also want to mention the um, project that Remain are doing. Uh, they, it's Invis Envision Resilience uh, for Nantucket, uh, uh, run by uh, Remain and um, they have an event in the Thomas Macy warehouse starting, I think is it the 2nd of July and running until December. Um, and just mentioned that that's something that people should check out. It's a slightly different version of it, but they have come up with some brilliant ideas and some excellent ways of looking at what might be done for the downtown area and surrounding environs. I have to say a particular thank you to the Coast Resiliency Advisory Committee members who, got, who were, uh, were invaluable and reviewed everything along the way. I'm just gonna name them all quickly in no particular order. Uh, Jen Carberg, Sarah Boyce, Ian Golding, Fritz McClure, Peter Brace, Graham Dervich, Matt Fee, Gary Beller and particularly to uh, Mary Longacre, the chair of the committee, and her constant work and input and feedback that has been so useful throughout this process. Um, we have an incoming crack member in the next uh, beginning in, in July, uh, Joanna Roach. Uh, look forward to working with you. Quick thank you to town staff, uh, too numerous to mention, but particularly for Libby Gibson, Jeff Carlson, Holly Backus, and Chuck Larson, who I rely on all day, every day. Um, most obviously, thanks uh, the, the the project team here, Arcadis, Stas, One Architecture, 
and the Craig Group, in particular thanks to Trevor uh, Johnson, Kate Edwards and Jen Latchmer, who um, are always at the other end of an email and always extremely helpful and have done excellent work together with their teams this, uh, th to get this ready for tonight and in preparation for the final Coast Resilience Plan due for delivery in the end of September. Lastly, I have to thank all the participants who came along tonight. Uh, topped out at 120 at one point, we had excellent participation for uh, a Thursday night, a beautiful, pristine Thursday night out here in Nantucket, uh, where the weather was too nice to be indoors, yet everyone joined us indoors for another Zoom meeting. Thank you so very much, everyone, for participating. Public participation makes this process work. Thank you, Vince. That was maybe that was like far better than any Oscar acceptance speech that I've ever heard. So <laughs> really excellent. Um, and I'll just say I'm I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes. I hate to jump off these calls so abruptly at the end. So anybody, you know, this is this is the end of the formal proceedings. But if there are other questions or just people want to chat, that's uh, Okay. I'm happy to happy to do that. And the rest of the project team, you all you guys are, can jump off. No, no need to stick around. But I'm sure I'm sure people may have 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 may want to enjoy the last couple minutes of daylight. Uh, so hopefully uh, I would I would uh, encourage you to do that if you uh, if you have the choice. Trevor, I'm going to look forward to your reports on what the other breakout groups who are talking about, especially on well, that downtown area, I'd be interested to see what, what other breakout groups thought about some of these issues. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be sharing all of that material. What I said on mute was you guys did a great job. Thank you. Oh. Very <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thank you for your uh, help and leadership. Any other closing thoughts? Uh, Vince wasn't in our breakout group, I don't think, on the South Shore. He, he joined for a little bit at the end there, yeah, for, for the South Shore discussion. So I wanted to ask Vince, um, there's some hard armament concepts with those tubes with like kind of the, looks like screens different than the beach that have been floating around. And I had asked if, you know, we were approving things like that for areas like the sewer bed, would there be any way to get Army Corps of Engineers, DEP and the town to do blanket approvals if it was an implementation versus property by property? When you say the screens, do you mean the new shore devices? Yes. Yeah. So we're looking at that quite closely for the Madicate area. And if we can get it to work in one area, be nice to roll it out in other areas. There's uh, property ownership uh, points to consider all along the South Shore. If it got, uh, there's a linear nature to these things so that if we could um, have part of it on groups of private property and part of it on a piece of town property, I, I, there's potential for it to work that way. Um, it is an interesting concept, but I think it just needs a little bit more vetting and trying to understand how New Shore works. I'm very interested in it, but it seems to be designed for uh, a situation in Florida and Georgia. I don't think it's been implemented any further north than that, uh, where they have implemented for the winter, uh, put it in in the fall, take out the system in the summer and have accreted sand in place for the summertime. Um, but we get such violent winter storms, would it last here? If the engineers uh, were able to do an analysis on it and say, yes, let's see, I'm all for it. If it can work, anything that will work, I'll take. Thank you, Vince. I think I see Liz Holland waving her hand. I think she was waving goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Hmm. Um, this is uh, Leslie Forbes on a borrowed computer. So my name is not Alanis Reznor. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. We, um, can, just, we can hear Alanis. 
It's, yes, but it's not Alanis, it's Leslie. Um, thank you for this. It gives me hope that um, with this research and your experience that we can actually move forward and take some very large uh, policy decisions uh, with community input because clearly incrementing our way to some sort of solution is not going to get us it's not going to keep us safe so we need to think big and do big and make policy changes with community input and your expertise so thank you arcadis Looks like Deanne has her hand raised. Thank you, Trevor. Um, I think this is a question for Vince. Um, we had always been under the impression that some of the main infrastructure on the South Shore, such as the airport, the um, surf wa Surfside wa Wastewater Treatment Plant, and the Sconset sewer beds were mandated by DEP and FAA to have contingency plans in case erosion threatened those facilities and that there was always um, a, an approved plan in place for them to retreat landward to move out of harm's way. And I don't know if that's a fact. If it is, it would be helpful to have that information. Yeah, so um, for the sewer plant, um, I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist because David Gray um, and I have spoken about it and I don't think it exists. For the, um, for the, um, for the airport, um, I don't know either. And uh, all I can say is I'm going having a conversation with them, uh, I think early next week and I'll find out more at that point. Um, so it's in progress. Oh, good. Thank you, Vince. Just one more comment. Um, in addition to a thank you to Trevor and his team, I see that Bill Klein is one of the participants. And I don't know if the Arcadis team is aware that Bill Klein is a famous planner here on Nantucket. He was the originator of the concept of the land bank. And Bill, I don't know you personally, but I'm really glad that you're here for this process. Um, we value your wisdom and your input and your insight. I appreciate those kind words. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard even after seven years of retirement to stay away from this stuff. So anyway, well, thank, lucky us. thanks for the comment. Yeah, and glad to be in the company of uh, uh, planning greats. <laughs> um, certainly, the land bank is a is a amazing resource for the community and um, something to be uh, cherished. So, and thanks, Deanne, for your questions. We are we are talking with the airport uh, next uh, next week, and so we can follow up on those questions with them. Excellent, Trevor. Thank you. I see Bruce Mandel has his hand up. Hey, Bruce. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for this uh, forum today. It was very good. And I just wanted to echo uh, the comments about Bill Klein. Um, I remember dealing with uh, him very carefully back in the late 60s, 70s, and, and such. And he's very influential and brilliant. But I, there's something that's troubling me with this whole process. And, you know, we all want to think that government federal, state, local, town, uh, is going to solve this problem, protect us, and is then going to somehow pay for this. And it's obvious to me, at least, and to others, that there are going to be areas on this island that are either going to be too expensive to protect or maybe not possible to protect. And when are we gonna talk about those areas and what's going to happen if the town and the other governments, and there's not enough money 
out there to help protect us. How are groups and individuals going to address this? Or are we just going to say, you know what? Some places are just sacrificial lambs. When are we going to talk about that? That's a, you're getting to the heart of the matter, Bruce, I think. Um, you know, I think I'm not sure which, which area you, um, uh, you focused on in your group, but you may notice that outside of the downtown, a lot of our strategies um, do, do require, you know, or assume homeowner uh, action, right? Action by private residents to evaluate, you know, the circumstances that, that, that face their properties because each property owner has their own risk tolerance, right? Their own ability to live with or without water, um, or to deal with the risks uh, posed by erosion, and so part of it is is it's going to be up to a, it's going to be up to individual property owners to to make a decision for themselves about how much they can how much risk they can live with. I think that's one part of it. The second part is I think at a from a policy perspective, a regulatory perspective, and this is something that the CRP is going to get into is thinking about in those areas that maybe not by 2030 or, you know, 2040, we, you know, maybe there's still a, a potential to live in those areas. Um, but in the out years, 2050, towards the end of the century, we see such extreme risk from, from really frequent flooding or a likelihood of, of extreme exposure to erosion where we need to reduce density, right? We need to, we need to use the tools that we have at our disposal to make sure that, you know, we don't, increase the number of housing units in a place that's really prone to flooding in the future. Because those housing units are gonna be there for 50 or more years, right? Um, and if we know what the risks are gonna look like over that time horizon, we can plan for that. Um, and then I think the third kind of leg of that stool is we do need, you know, and, and this is just not Nantucket, this is across the, the country, you know, we need to be thinking about how we can help homeowners, um, you know, fund strategies for their properties. Um, and also think about ways of, of getting out of areas that, you know, they didn't know that they were living in a risky area, right? And uh, they are now. And so they need to, we need to make sure that we, we, we help people become whole. And I think those are the kind of like, those are, those are the broad strokes approaches we can use, but they're, um, you know, not all of it is going to be possible for Nantucket as a, as a municipality, as a government to implement on its own. Well, I appreciate that. That, that viewpoint, I'm just not understanding how it's gonna work for Nantucket. Individual homeowners can take steps, but unless they do it as a community, it's failing. I can elevate my house, but if my neighbors don't, and if we don't protect the coast, I can elevate the house 40 feet and it's still gonna fail. I won't have an infrastructure to support it. This is something that Matt Fee is very, very keyed on, a uh, very forward thinking select person, but he's not He's not getting much support. And right now we're in the midst of redesigning the Massasoit Bridge of Manicot and the Ames Street Bridge. And the recommendation of the engineers was to raise the bridges. And the town has made a conscious decision not to do that, to let those bridges fail. But how are we dealing with the consequences of that? When we talk about, well, if Ames Street Bridge fails, there's no access to a very large community. And whether they're seasonal or year round is irrelevant, they're property owners and taxpayers, but we're, the concept right now is to abandon them. And the same thing with the Massasoit Bridge, you know, it's supposed to flood on a daily basis as soon as, you know, 10, 15 years. That's a key access point to a large part of the West End community, but a decision is being made by town that well, it's a little too costly right now to raise that bridge, so we'll just let it fail and deal with it later. How are we going to address that now so something like that doesn't happen? Vince looks like he wanted to weigh in here. So it's a particularly interesting one, and without wishing to absolutely pass the buck, but there's a certain amount that has to be taken into account. You, Bruce, you're aware that um, DPW are working with, I think, a company called CLE, 
um, who are doing the engineering works on that bridge. So we're going to try and work with them to try and see what might be done, but they are already quite far down the process of developing uh, their solutions and at the direction of the DPW. I realized that and we reviewed their suggestions and made our suggestions that, hey, one of the options they said was raise the bridge. And the town said, no. So what I, my question is not, I'm not trying to point fingers. What I'm trying to do is point out a direction that we're taking. The town, we just, we just spoke about reducing density, but the finance director and the finance department have presented to the select board the concept of maximizing development in order to enhance real estate tax revenue to support the town. So we're talking out of one side of our mouth, but the powers that be are not in step with us. How do we make this happen is my question. The other, I think I the other- I expect you to answer it, Vince. <laughs> but we've got, we've got all these yeah. consultants here and they've all dealt with issues like this before, but that question's not on the table and I think it needs to be. Yeah, I, I think Bruce, the, yeah, these are all good, good points and good questions. I think the other point to this is the questions about reducing growth in certain areas and increasing growth in other areas is a really good one to have and it needs to happen comprehensively, right? Like we, we're to, the, the comprehensive, uh, sorry, the coastal resilience plan is a comprehensive resilience plan, but it can't really make recommendations. We haven't had a process that supports making recommendations about where Nantucket might wanna grow to compensate for where it might need to shrink, right? And I think that we can start to lay out from a, from a, uh, risk exposure perspective, you know, areas where we think at a certain time horizon, it's not going to be cost effective to protect these areas and, and it's going to be risky and hazardous to live. But it's hard for us to, you know, it's, I think there needs to be a conversation about what do you, where do those people go, right? And where, where can they live? How can they continue to enjoy Nantucket in a place that is high ground? Well, that, that's my point. And how do yeah. we discuss that? I mean, we already know what areas are not going to be around in 10, 15, and 20 years. So obviously, we don't want to stress growth there. So we know what areas are not going to be flooded. Obviously, if you're going to stress development, it's got to be in those areas. Yeah. But we're not in this discussion. My understanding is Nantucket is in the about to begin the uh, an, another comprehensive planning process, and um, I think that that is the vehicle to have that conversation. And the fact that the CRP is kind of happening before is wonderful because we, we don't see a lot of comprehensive plans that really integrate the coastal resilience questions very uh, substantively. And Nantucket has is going to have a real opportunity to to think about comprehensive planning in the context of climate change. Well, and hope, when I say com island-wide comprehensive planning. Well, I understand that, but I, I guess what I'm asking for is that the group, our Arcadis and their consultants that are helping us, if you would include this in your discussion points, I'm not looking for a solution, I'm looking for a direction. Um, not, not to speak out of turn, um, I think Trevor is right, uh, not to reiterate the same point over and over again, but the, the proper forum for discussing this is